Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Stark, and I'm currently uh, a fellow here at the Information Law Institute at NYU. And we're so excited to have you all here. Apologies for the lack of seats, um, but that's always, I guess, a good sign. Um, the idea behind this event was um, to bring together a group of thinkers and visionaries um, who could provide their own perspectives and um, paint their own pictures of the future of the net. And I think of a lot of the scenarios that we'll be discussing tonight, um, some of them may be more plausible than others, but they're all uh, futures that we could envision. And we'd very much like for, I know we have a lot of people here, the audience, to um, ask questions and participate after we do have uh, the panel begin. So now, without further ado, I think we'd like to start with um, Clay Shirky, professor at NYU's um, ITP program and author of the new book, Here Comes Everybody, which I have and I'm very much enjoying. Great. Thanks very much. And Clay will tell us a little bit about um, his perspective on the future of the internet painting a picture of what's to come. Well, actually, uh, not quite, because uh, since I'm an academic, I never okay. make predictions. Uh, and <laughs> if you call me in 10 years, I'll tell you why what happened was inevitable, though. So that's, that's, that's my job. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of civilization, a lot of what we recognize, whether it's law and government or art and culture, is an answer to the question, what do we do with all this surplus? Right? In some cases, it's energetic surplus, as with the re Industrial Revolution. In some cases, it's caloric surplus, as with the Agricultural Revolution. But what happens after a period of surplus is that you have something that's never been deployed before, and society has to figure out how to build on top of it. One of the big surprises is that periods of prolonged surplus can be as wrenching to social institutions as, as periods of uh, prolonged privation. So uh, hold that thought. Uh, I, I find myself in the position now at the Interactive Telecommunications Program of having to teach my own youth as ancient history, right? <laughs> which is a little daunting, but whatever, that's the job now. And one of the things that, that separates me from many of my 20-something students is that the web is already built out when they got there. Right? They're used to it being urban scale. And so I've got a slide I put up, which is Linus Torvald's first message to Usenet about what became Linux and Larry Sanger's first message to the new PDA list about what became Wikipedia. And if you'd been asked to pick out of the volume of the internet what was the most important message that day, there is absolutely no way you could have found those messages. They're both incredibly modest. <laughs> Torvald says, right, I'm starting this operating system as a hobby. Right? I'm never going to put, port it to any hard disk except the ones I happen to own. Right? It's this very, very simple thing. Larry went on the new PDA list and said, ah, you know, go, go do this. It's going to take you all of 10 minutes. It's a little experiment. Right? That, to me, is the big deal. Right? Everybody here has spent the better part of our adult lives thinking about the internet. And there is zero chance that individually or combined, we could tell you what the most important thing coming is. Right? That's, that's one of the changes. Right? The amount of flexibility that's been pushed out to society. Uh, the English historian John Barnett said that the most, by his, by his lights, the most important invention during the Industrial Revolution, the thing that really made it go, was gin. <laughs> and the idea was that only gin was going to help people manage the wrenching transition from rural to industrial life. And it was only after society woke up from a kind of metaphorical, and in some cases literal, hangover did what we regard as the value of the Industrial Revolution actually come to play. My vote for that in the second half of the 20th century, the thing that was most important for helping us move to a post-industrial society, was the sitcom. That was the thing that let people manage the transition to suburbanized life, to symbolic manipulation. You really believe this? I do believe this. <laughs> I do believe this. Uh, just checking. But, but, right, the sitcom essentially took all of the sociality that was being ripped apart as people were being distributed to the service and gave something, people something to do in the evening. What does the since, infomercial represent? Since they weren't talking to <laughs> Well, so here's the thing. Like yeah, the future the of the internet. Uh, like, <laughs> like, like Jen, we're waking up from that now. And in the post-sitcom world, we've got this enormous cognitive circuit. Anytime anybody asks you, where do people get the time to do this, this Lawcat stuff, this Wikipedia stuff, this Linux stuff, right? ask them where they get the time to watch dozens of hours of television a week. Right? It makes no sense to ask that question since the time people are putting into this stuff was freed up long ago. It was freed up in the 50s and 60s. 
It's just that in the age of the sitcom, it was never put to any productive use. Right? <laughs> that, that's what we're seeing now. Right? The internet is the first thing we've ever had that really deserves to be called media, which is to say a truly general purpose middle layer between any two or any many endpoints for any purpose that anybody would like to press it into service to. The internet means you don't have to ask for help or permission before trying anything. Right? And that's my vision for the future of the internet, is not a particular thing, but continued support for diverse surprises. Right? That's, that's, I think, the big deal. Right. It's not going to be that there is one future. There are going to be many futures. And, and I think the principal job right now for people thinking about the future of the Internet is actually to preserve that flexibility on behalf of anybody who'd like to try anything new. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Um, Next, I think I'm going to put Professor Tim Wu <laughs> of Columbia Law School. I'm also chair of the Board of Free Press, as I understand, um, on the spot. <laughs> well, is that OK? <laughs> um, and feel free to react to Clay, um, provide your vision of where we're going, or many visions, or maybe the lack of a vision. Can I, I thought being over here with you know, I could have like, had to think for a long time. But all right. <laughs> and, and feel free to stay. Make, make something up, in other words. <laughs> all right. Uh, I didn't, didn't realize that I'll be next. Well, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Tim Wu, and uh, I teach up the one line at uh, Columbia. Um, <laughs> so future of, of, the, of the internet. Um, my sense is that there is a natural pattern. And the thing that I think is most interesting is that there is a natural pattern of consolidation and deconsolidation, centralization and decentralization that has marked the structure of industry in general in the 20th century, but also in particular of the media industries in the 20th century. And from my view, what the future of the internet will be about is a collision between an ideology of decentralization and uncontrolled media with the existing and in many ways much more powerful structure of centralized media that has dominated the 20th century. In other words, much of the 21st century will be kind of a battle between organizational forms more common in the 19th against those in the 20th century. That's kind of what the 21st century will be about, I guess. 19 plus 20, 21, something. <laughs> um, so let me talk more about what that, that thesis I is about. And one of the things I'm doing right now, like everyone else here, is writing a book. And <laughs> otherwise, I don't have anything to say. Um, what is, the, what is the title of the book? Yeah, I, I, that's a very good, good question. Uh, but I'll, well, I, just I tell think you it should be Up the One Line. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it could be called, uh, I don't know what it's going to be called. Uh, so, but the book is more in existence than not having a title. So let me tell you what, the, uh, what, the, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. There's a period when you look, I mean, people say, oh, you know, we're in this unprecedented period. We're in this impossibly diverse and unusually decentralized period of media. And my response to that is that it's true on the one hand, but we've also that we've been here before. If you look 100 years ago in that period, you will find something that is akin to a first YouTube era before our current YouTube era, which is the early days of, of film. And that was a period where in the United States, it's not the same levels of production, but there were approximately 11 movies made every day. There were about 11 movies made every day, for some like four or 5,000 made every year. And the movies were, you know, they were censored, they were, like, they were somewhat censored, but they were on a very wide variety of topics, you know, all kinds of random stuff. Just even walking around with a camera in Paris was enough to be a film. And so there, there was an era in film where it was not like it is now about being sort of 
uh, or especially in the in the 30s, 40s, but sort of centralized and quality controlled in exactly a certain way, but very random and, and scattered. And that was the way many of the media industries were when they started. The telephone industry is very similar at its beginning. You have fierce competition between Bell and, and a whole bunch of sort of random phone companies that set up their, they just sort of string wires all over the place, including barbed wire telephones. It's a very decentralized area, 1890s through the about 1913, uh, 14. Uh, radio starts in the same way, very chaotic. You can basically just set anything up and, and you know, put out things that people might want to listen to and, and see what happens. All of these industries undergo a massive transformation by the 1930s to which they are the industries we know today as sort of big media. Controlled, centralized, um, with many redeeming qualities. I don't want to only say that as if it's a bad thing. Uh, big can have its advantages too. These are you're able to make films with larger budgets. The telephone system run by Bell is magnificent in certain ways. It is perfect. It always works when you pick up the telephone. And so, and in uh, uh, radio, you have National Broadcasting Corporation, which is able, thanks to the start of advertising, to have all these shows, network television. So you have this, this built-up existing centralized media structure. In the 1970s, that structure finally starts to come under some serious attack. And one of those attacks is what we're so interested in today, is this device called the personal computer and its companion that was invented somewhere around the same time, the network of networks, the internet. And these were all premised on a very different underlying philosophy, a philosophy of ownership. You know, you actually own a computer with all its pieces while the phone was just leased to you. You could never buy a phone in the old days. Under, it has the, the, the principle um, of being uncontrolled and, and uncentralized. And these things, which as, as Claire already said, start in a very small place, you know, in academia, in government, in California, in, in weird places like that. Uh, <laughs> that these, that oh, West Coast people. <laughs> yeah, that's not. I, anyway, that these, <laughs> that, that, that these things all start, and then they develop into what we know as the internet right now. And then you have this large question, which I think is the question of today, is whether this will the internet is now going to go through the same cycle that the rest of the media industries went through in the 20th century. That is, whether the, you know, the, some of the natural economic forces of consolidation will demand what Virgin Mobile was talking about today, which is an internet which good content gets better priority, bad content gets worse priority, sort of the opposite of net neutrality, to just sort of put it out there. Worse content, better content decided by the people who run the networks. Um, whether or not Computers remain what they are. This is Jonathan's favorite theme. Whether hard drives are banned in 20 years as a, you know, something that interferes with the job of the FBI, uh, right? Whether hard drives are just something that gets banned. Whether the internet flips from being fundamentally, as I said, out of control or fundamentally something that is a permission-based network where you get on the internet if you are the right type of thing. Right, and where Wikipedia is kicked off as a security threat. <laughs> that, I think, is the question whether or not that natural, whether that is natural, uh, this consolidation I'm talking about, or whether it's something that people decide on, and whether the structure of the existing media industries comes to the internet and makes it more like itself. So that's my interest in the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I'd like to ask Lauren Cornell, who is executive director of Rhizome.org, um, the preeminent uh, organization devoted to promoting um, art, digital art and culture, and um, pretty much the pioneer when it comes to the internet and art. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Can you hear me if I talk like this? Uh, the mics aren't on. The mics oh, the mics aren't on. So well. um, so when I was preparing for this panel, I was, I was thinking a lot about the art world. And something that is interesting to me is that unlike a lot of other industries, such as the newspaper industry, the media industry, the film industry, the art world's baseline economics and values have not really been terribly challenged by the internet. 
Um, it's still a system, a gallery system largely, that is vertical, um, is based on an economics of scarcity. Um, some people say it's oligarchic. It hates transparency. So it sounds really awful, but it's really not all that bad. A funny personal um, <laughs> anecdote is that this is actually, um, at some disillusioned point in my career, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer, and I took the LSATs in this very room. Um, but, then, but then I got the job at Rhizome, and I changed my mind. Um, I'm glad that you're here now. So. <laughs> no, I'm here. Um, but so um, when I got the job at Rhizome, um, I was excited because art that engages new technologies is necessarily involved in um, culture that's moving forward. Uh, a critic once said that new technologies are new relationships, and really that's how I, I look at this art, because it's really reflecting on a new kind of behaviors, attitudes, relationships, um, and it's really at the forefront of what's happening in culture. Um, Rhizome itself is, is kind of a, a model of how the internet is beginning to coordinate with the art world. Um, it started as a mailing list, so um, in 96 is this kind of community generated forum and I think actually the, the, eighth, uh, <laughs> the eighth member of Rhizome is sitting in the back there, T. <laughs> Wynn. Um, anyway, so it started as this community generated forum and has um, over its history become a nonprofit, become an institution but it still retained that, that community, which I think is really significant. But it's also added on this sort of curatorial, editorial voice. Um, and so it's a hybrid, which I think is, um, is in a way something that is indicative of how other sort of user-generated um, community sites might go. Um, because we've become not only home to a community, but also the place that people go to try to wrap their heads around what this art form is um, and understand its different elements. Um, so that's another thing. Um, the artists that were uh, involved with Rhizome early on, like the member I just pointed to, were really kind of predicting um, certain trends and practices that would happen and evolve um, later on the internet. This kind of idea of the way that they were working together, sharing and, and uh, discussing, really predates this kind of what people talk about with the Web 2.0 kind of sites. And I think you that that- You guys Web 2.0 before Web 2.0, so it seems. So that's what I'm trying to say, I guess. Um, <laughs> Snap. <laughs> but, um, and I really do think that artists do that. And that's what's really another interesting part of working um, at Rhizome, is that artists really do um, explore the medium. I think it's artists and also um, porno pornographers that are always the first to test new mediums. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, and you know, there's something like this phenomenon um, of supercuts. I don't know if anyone knows that, but it's these online fan videos, and people are sort of pulling out every word, um, particular words from different movies. And that's a really popular phenomenon now. And that project was sort of predicted by the artists Jennifer and Kevin McCoy, who um, sort of early on were working with software art and built an application that um, pulled different, um, I think it was every, every instance of certain words in Starsky and Hutch. But anyway, that was 10 years before the, um, the advent of supercuts. But um, so challenges for this field, um, there are a lot of them. In fact, um, Rhizome, really the experience of working there every day is, feels a little bit embattled because I think this work really hasn't um, been accepted widely yet. Um, and so our job is really every day to justify it and advocate for it. Um, but I do think that will change, um, and it has changed even while I've been, been there for three years. Um, I've seen a sort of new generation of artists come up who, um, who work with the web in, in a way that's, that's quite intuitive, and you can just see how working with, working with it for them is different. Um, and so it, we've, we've, you know, because Rhizome's job is obviously to follow what artists do and to support them best, have sort of changed our mission from art that looks, you know, uh, that looking at just online to looking at more expanded practices of artists working online, but also working with objects and paintings and viral marketing and, and whatever it is. I mean, artists work in many different ways. And I I think that speaks to just the saturation of the internet um, on psychological and practical levels. Um, so, so challenges. Challenges are the understanding of art, um, of this kind of art, and that's sort of Rhizome's job to do is to advocate for it and, and artists um, to lead the way on that. Another, uh, another one, like I said, is economics. Um, I think a lot about artists' careers and how um, artists can support themselves when their works don't have a market value and galleries aren't supporting them and they don't fit in that world. Um, 
while I do think that there are a lot of um, actually pioneering gallerists who have supported this kind of work, and some of them are here tonight, postmasters people, um, I also wonder, um, I think two things will happen. Increasingly, this art will get picked up by galleries, um, and that's already happened very much in the past few years. But I think that also, um, I wonder if there are alternate economies for artists. Um, who maybe like looking at the model of a band or, or a small content producer online, could they make money that way? Is that possible? Um, and one other challenge is um, what the lawyer Wendy Seltzer, who I'm sure everybody knows in this room, deals with. Um, it's just chilling effects. Artists receiving cease and desist orders um, for appropriation of material. I just did a show at the New Museum of Contemporary Art where Rhizome is based. And a lot of the work appropriates material from the web. and the. The, the first question I always got was, is this legal? What if these people see this? Um, what if the, you know, there was clips from YouTube. What if these people from YouTube come? Instead of actually thinking about um, what the work was about. So I think um, those kind of issues are, are really at stake for artists, too. Um, but um, so I think, just in closing, that the future is now, especially in the arts. Um, artists are, are really, um, you can look to their practices to see what's coming. Um, but another thing I would also say, and maybe I just tell myself this to feel good every day, but that the future is, um, is bright for this kind of art, because I think that um, it's, it's gaining in cultural importance all the time. Next up, I'd like to invite uh, Jimmy Wales, or feel free to stay there either way, um, founder of Wikipedia and Wikia, and I think um, yeah. you need no more introduction. Okay, very good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I thought that Clay was going to say that the, the sitcoms of the 50s were as to porn on the internet, <laughs> the thing that made all this change, but actually she's the one who brought up porn on the internet, so. <laughs> Um, I have nothing to say about that topic. Um, so uh, when I think about the, the, the future of the internet, I, I, I think that it's, uh, the, the safest thing to do is to look at some of the long-term trends uh, that we've seen so far uh, and just extrapolate those a bit into the future. So um, one of the things that we have seen uh, very dramatically uh, on the internet is a, a move toward uh, community production of various kinds of works. The most obvious kind of thing would be, of course, Wikipedia, um, where large numbers of people have come together uh, to, cre to create something quite uh, large. So we, before Wikipedia and before this kind of community move on the internet, we saw in the early days of the internet, uh, everybody started making home pages, uh, creating uh, free home pages on somewhere like GeoCities. And some of them were quite good and some of them were quite bad, uh, but they were individually produced. They were not really the work of a community. GeoCities used to call themselves a community, but it didn't really make any sense. Uh, they were a free home page provider. Um, now we've moved into an era where communities are really, really important online, uh, and that community production of uh, all kinds of different things um, is an increasing phenomenon. And so when I think about the future, one of the things I always like to look at is, if you think about the technology behind Wikipedia, um, all of the pieces of the technology existed six years prior to Wikipedia. So what do you need to create a wiki? You need a web browser, a web server, you need a database. Uh, you need the idea of a wiki, which is uh, you know the website that anyone can edit. But wikis were invented by a guy named Ward Cunningham in 1995. And so from 95 until 2001, when I launched Wikipedia, wikis were this kind of small underground phenomenon. And they had their own little subculture on the internet. Uh, but it wasn't really popularized. It was just something that was going on uh, quietly on the internet. Um, what I wonder about now is I think about uh, the way we collaborate in Wikipedia. It's quite easy to collaborate on text, but how do you collaborate, do a mass collaboration on video, music, uh, different kinds of art, these kinds of things? Um, and what I always like to stop and think about is how, uh, the, you know, when I first think about people doing mass collaborations of music, how can we get lots of people together to uh, record music or write music? And I think, wow, well, we need to build the tools for that. And then I think to myself, well, maybe we don't need to build the tools for that. Uh, maybe we're in the same situation today that we were uh, at the beginning of Wikipedia. Maybe all the tools that we need to do some really interesting and amazing things 
are already out there, but nobody has thought of the social model to bring all these people together to actually do this. And so we begin to see things when we think about things like supercuts, where you have communities of people doing editing for whatever purpose. They're, they're using tools. Um, mostly that stuff is just kind of fun, silly stuff on the internet right now. But what happens when they decide to make, um, you know, a, a global documentary um, where you interview a um, hundred people all over the world and edit it together into a, into a massive uh, statement of the man on the street from everywhere in the world? That kind of thing would be too expensive to do for a traditional studio. You can't go out, uh, even CNN or a large news organization can't go out and in a single day interview um, a thousand people. But the internet can um, and can edit all that together to build something amazing. So those are the kinds of things that I, that I think we're going to see coming. Um, another important element is to realize the global nature of the internet. Um, and I think we're about to see some really interesting and unusual changes come about because of this. Uh, right now there are something like around a billion people online. And in the next five to ten years, by some estimates, there'll be the next billion people coming online. But they're not going to come online from the US or Europe or Japan, because we're all pretty much online already. I mean, some of us aren't, but most of us are. They're going to be coming online in China, in South America, in Africa. Uh, and we're going to see interaction with, with cultures and peoples um, who we have not had a lot of direct contact with. And I think that's going to lead to some really interesting uh, phenomena. If you look at the, the overall, the global price of food, what is the global price of food? And it's, it's gotten a little cheaper over time with technological increases, but it's pretty flat. If you look at the price of telecommunications, right, due to Moore's Law, it's radically dropping every year. Um, so I always say as a joke, but a joke meant to make people think that, you know, those people starving in Africa, pretty soon they're going to call us to complain because they're going to have access to cell phone technology perhaps before they ac have access to uh, stable food supplies. And that's a really strange thing to think about. But if you look at the trends and the cost of these things, it seems inevitable. Um, so finally, um, I, that's sort of m my view. The, the kinds of things that I'm concerned about um, would be the kinds of things that Jonathan talks about in his book, so I think he'll handle the concerns for us. Um, but uh, the, the free, wide open, as he calls it, the generative technologies of the internet um, may be something that we're going to see people turning away from. And we may see a bit of a closing of the internet in a lot of different interesting ways. Some of the kinds of things that I see that concern me uh, would be the expansion of Chinese-style censorship um, to many, many more places. A lot of people really don't understand uh, really how that works because the, 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 the firewall in China is quite porous. It's quite, uh, people can get around it, young people get around it, journalists get around it. That isn't really the point though, right? The point is the chilling effects. The point is not to have absolute control over the flow of information, but to have an uh, undue influence over the way things work. Um, and well, we couldn't possibly have that here, um, except when you start thinking about, um, well, I, I don't think we could have well, maybe we could, but um, <laughs> but the kinds of things that I'm concerned about would be things like um, uh, we're moving to these platforms with APIs, where um, something like the Facebook API, where if you want to, if you are a young upstart programmer and you're thinking about building Wikipedia several years ago, you would just get a server and start working and you're totally independent and no one can really control you or stop you. Whereas today, if you're a young upstart programmer, you might think, wow, the cool and interesting and the fast way to grow something like this, I'm going to do it as a Facebook app. But guess what? You've just tied yourself to a particular platform where they have very strong controls over what you're going to do in the future. But yet, it's actually really useful. I mean, Facebook apps are really useful, and all those things are very useful. And so we may be tempted down some pathways that may eliminate some of the is creativity. Is really that useful? Although I think that's probably one of the more useful ones. How about Secret Crush? <laughs> I like the one where I can be a zombie. That's exactly. useful. Exactly. You are the only one. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start it? <laughs> I, I'm right. innocent. No. Pirates versus Ninja. I actually, I, like I, I block all applications now. I get a, I get a Facebook application invite. I just block them so all. I don't even look the at them. There's potential for usefulness. There is, in, in so theory, far. right? All right, I'm done. Well, thank you. <laughs> and now, last but certainly not least, um, Professor Jonathan Zittrin, um, professor here at NYU, Oxford, and Harvard. You couldn't possibly have more affiliations. And no, I uh, could. <laughs> author of I'm working the on it. Farm worker <laughs> 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 author of the. <laughs>
I pick the coffee beans of ideas just as they ripen. Author of the just released book yesterday, uh, The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. So I guess I want to do what Clay says academics should never do, which is offer some predictions for the future. But I'll hedge my bets the way Clay would say that I should, by offering you alternative, plausible futures, one of which is bound to be right. <laughs> so here's future number one. I call it rainbows and buttercups. <laughs> and I want to take Clay's invitation to kind of attach a pop cultural meme to each future so that you'll remember it more easily. Uh, the first uh, one I think would be Sid and Marty Croft's like HR Puffin stuff. Do people remember that or is that too dated a reference? Yeah. Thank yeah. God for Nick at Night. I, I see the rainbows and buttercups futures as having all of the elements that Tim and Clay and Jimbo and Lauren extol about the internet we have today where random people in a garage can smoke a joint and do something unusual and new and cool and before you know it it's HR puff and stuff and like how did that ever get on television um, but while it's trippy it also then ends up becoming big business the stuff that works ideas as totally whacked out as Jimbo's idea to start an encyclopedia that anyone can edit at any time. It's still a really stupid idea. We know that Wikipedia works in practice, but not in theory. And that's a future where that kind of stuff can take place and we can all just go, wow. And it is, I mean, the reason I, I'm invoking this trippy stuff is it is, in fact, a collective hallucination. And the more I learn about the net and realize what a collective hallucination the actual internet is, the kinds of mere handshakes on which it operates, the more I remain amazed. And as long as that's our present, maybe that will be... Sort of like law. Sort of like law. And reading and writing. But significantly oh, less fair. boring. The rest of Sorry. <laughs> no, really, but please continue. <laughs> Future number two. We would call this the Internet Meltdown. If it were a movie, we would title it Internet Threat or Menace. <laughs> It would star Charlton Heston and Roddy McDowell as the sympathetic chimp who rules everyone. Did people watch Planet of the Apes? That was good. And at the end, it's the Statue of Liberty. Jeez, I hope for people who haven't seen it that I haven't just ruined the movie. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Sorry. Um, that kind of future is one where the openness from future number one you suddenly just realize, it's like that scene in Reservoir Dogs where they're all pointing guns at each other and you're waiting to see who's going to shoot first and then eventually everybody shoots and it goes south fast. <laughs> um, that is a very plausible scenario. The kinds of collective hallucinations that keep the internet and the PC propped up are starting to be eaten away by reality. And occasionally reality eats away at Wikipedia. And Wikipedia sort of fights back with a little of its magic pixie dust. But I'm concerned that we might run out of that dust and that when reality sets in, the alternatives have been waiting. The ITU has drawn up secret plans that is ready to give us the internet that we probably should have had to begin with that's much less interesting, much more lockdownable, much more predictable, and frankly, much more suitable to uh, the expectations that many people in power, whether in business or in government, had. So um, anytime I think about the quarter of a billion zombie computers that Vince Cerf says are there waiting to be directed to attack, I think about the internet meltdown uh, scenario. Scenario number three, I would say, is um, is sort of the not with a bang but with a whimper scenario. And I would uh, liken that most perhaps to leave it to Beaver. It's kind of pleasant but insidious. And after a while you wonder where your life went watching uh, reruns of the thing. And yes, I think that is a future symbolized by the magic, glorious iPhone that Tim is no longer using. Oh, there it is. Um, not Tim's iPhone in particular. Have you, have you jailbroken your iPhone? Yeah. Yes, sorry, didn't mean to challenge you there. Um, <laughs> so specifically not Tim's iPhone, but the iPhone that most people have that is really cool. It's really slick. I want one too. Trust me, I wake up sometimes with the DTs wanting an iPhone. 
But I think you'll give in eventually. I will. I will. But it's a prison of sorts because it says it's really nasty out there. Come on home, have some cool icons, have something that works for once. <laughs> and yes, we'll allow third parties to code for it, but we license them. They put it out through the iPhone app store and I, Steve Jobs, reserve the right to kill any app that I don't like, even after the fact. And any regulator knows he or she can go to Steve Jobs and say, I don't care what you think, you'd better kill that app. It's the same vulnerabilities that exist that Jimbo was talking about on the Facebook platform, on the Google Apps platform, in fact, on nearly all of the cloud computing platforms that from a technical standpoint are very exciting, but from a social and political standpoint really serve uh, to change the name of the game. So what future do I want? I'd like to see a happy federated future where if you want your iPhone, I'm not gonna give you guff about it, it's fine. It's like if I'm a vegetarian, you can eat meat. I'll like think ill of you just in my head. I won't tell you anything bad about it. And maybe I'll sneak a rib or two every so often. Um, but that still pretty much everybody has a mischief box. And that's really what the PC is. There are other ways to instantiate. It doesn't have to come in the form of a ThinkPad. But there is some way for nearly everyone who is online to be able to make some mischief in the form of writing or running some software that doesn't come from the incumbents and that allows them then to do things that aren't necessarily approved by the incumbents. Does that mean they can do bad things? Absolutely. Just like the incumbents can do bad things as well. And I'd rather put my trust with the mob, I mean with the crowd. Wait, come on, Clay. <laughs> Line? <laughs> I'd rather put my trust with everybody. Here they come. Um, <laughs> than with uh, the few. So what do I want to, uh, how do we get to this future? I feel like we have to fight for it. It's not going to happen naturally. In fact, the wonderful cold calculation of the market is right now taking us away from it. For consumers, I want consumers to realize that they should want a mischief box. I want to shake them by the lapels and talk them into it. And as their products that Tim was talking about become services, I want them to get a little bit nervous. My analogy is to the toaster that you buy, and you come down one day for breakfast, and there's a third slot, thanks to the winter update. <laughs> and then, two days later, it's gone because there was a bug, and they have to patch it, and it's back to two again. And then, a week later, it's making orange juice. <laughs> and at some point, you're like, what did I buy? <laughs> it's a breakfast thing. That never give... bought anything. Right, exactly. Anything. That's the future you that repeal the law of private J I'm J nervous J about. <laughs> no, really. I applaud your irrational <laughs> exuberance. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I get it. Um, for the, the developers of the world, I want them to actually get a little bit of, dare I say, political consciousness. I want them to see that they're they're not too cool to care about the fine print or about what can happen and to assume they can hack around it, which I credit that they can, but when they hack around it, they leave the rest of us behind. And I don't want the ending of Atlas Shrugged where it's a goodie. All the capitalists spoiler retreat. Alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> if you get through 2,000 pages, I mean, my God. You didn't read the Rage Edge. <laughs> I skipped over that. Just okay, like I, I got gotcha. you. I skipped the poetry in Lord of the Rings, too. So, yeah. who's with me? That's here comes everybody. Yeah. But the ending of Atlas Shrugged, where all the good capitalists go into a golden valley and mow each other's lawns and the rest of the world sinks into the sea that they've earned from their perniciousness. I don't want the hackers to be alone in their golden valley swapping electronica with each other. I want that to be available for everybody. So that's what I want to do. I want to see people fighting for it and I want to see the public policy people realizing that if they try to bring about a more regulable future for their own sake, they're really giving a help to China, to Saudi Arabia, to authoritarian places without the rule of law who can then borrow these technologies and deploy them in ways that we haven't even thought of. If I may, one bonus prediction for the future, just because I didn't want the Windows logo up there all the time. Um, no offense to the ex-Windows people in the room, and you know who you are. Um, I have been thinking hard about Mechanical Turk. 
I think it's a very cool thing. I don't know if people are familiar with these human intelligence tasks. Some of you may be performing them right now. You can go to Amazon Mechanical Turk and just look at things. Here's a penny per. Are these watches different? <laughs> a penny awaits you to answer this question. <laughs> wow! And when you're done with it, there are 53,157 more, which my keen mind tells me you could earn $531.58 by identifying similar watches. Why are you doing this? Who knows? Is it helping bad guys, good guys? I don't know. But this is starting to make a future in which our brains are server rack space. And somebody with watches that need comparing can add a few more brains onto the rack. I find it profoundly unsettling, and I hope you do too. Thank you. Thank you for our five wonderful talks. Um, the first issue that I'd like to bring up that I think everyone has touched upon um, is communities, um, online and off, and the role that they can play in shaping perhaps a better future. Um, I know that we've discussed the art community, the Wikipedia community, hackers, technologists, and I think that there is a role for people to play in shaping their own future especially given, um, for example, in Clay's book, Here Comes Everyone, he uses examples of how political communities and other online communities have worked um, toward a certain end. So if whoever would like to pitch in um, and to comment, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, 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 used to be, um, I used to be a cyber utopian. In fact, it was, it was exposure to, to, to Jonathan's work. This one of the things that helped talk me out of that. Uh, but one of the things that I, that I believed in my cyber utopian days is that someday we would all be big, you know, floaty video heads in a, in a, in a VR space, and the real world would fall away. Uh, and it turned out that was wrong, and it was wrong because the the bug was social scarcity, right? Back in the '90s, you had your real world friends and your imaginary friends online because your real world friends didn't have email. Right. But what I see now with my students is that the internet isn't an alternative to, to real life. It's just a, an instrumentation of it. They use it uh, in a completely embedded way. And so we're moving out of the world of online or offline communities. And to a first approximation, all communities now have aspects of both. Right. The open source movement has started moving towards these, let's get together for one weekend in one city to have a hackathon so we can sit face to face for a while. They are mostly distributed, but with occasional real world uh, models. Then you have communities that are mostly real world that use the internet for message exchange. So the, the first thing I think we're seeing is a hybridization of those, of those two patterns. Um, but the second thing that's interesting, uh, and, I, and I discovered this doing the book, a lot of the examples we have of collective action right now rely on stop energy. Their protest movements, their protests against commercial entities, their protests against governments, they are trying to get some other party to capitulate, whether it's the airline industry or Belarus. There's not yet a lot of start energy or sustain energy in collective action. It's very difficult for groups. Uh, it's very difficult for groups to actually stand up long term outside of relatively digital production like Linux, like Wikipedia, but for people with real world goals. And there seems to me to be a gap. Um, I, with, with Tim and Jonathan on the panel, I feel like a little bit of an idiot talking about the law. I am not a lawyer, but, but there does seem to be a legal gap, right? We've got the, the, the GPL, and we've got Creative Commons licenses, which allow us to produce intellectual property that presents to the state like copyright law, but subverts the nominal goals of copyright law from the inside. We don't have a way to defer to groups in the same way. And the way as a society we defer to groups is incorporation. We don't have any corporate structure that lets a group come together and say, on the inside, we are a cabal or a clutch or a clique, but on the outside, we're a corporation. Um, there's a couple of interesting experiments. David Johnson down at New York Law School is doing something called the Virtual Company Project up in Vermont. In the UK, they have the Community Interest Corporation and so forth. Um, but that seems to me to be a really pressing gap. Uh, we, it would be good for a way to, for, for the kind of groups we look at online to attain legal personhood in a way that doesn't jam everybody into this for-profit model. We don't, we don't have it yet, but I think it would help with the leverage that, that you're, you're, you're asking about, Elizabeth. Uh, Lauren, Jimmy, Tim? 
comments on the future of communities and how they can help proactively. And I think you made a really good point that a lot of what communities have come together about has been somewhat reactionary. And I think to have a preemptive movement is something that uh, could help so shape the future. I, I just wonder if, um, you know, uh, I'm just sitting here digesting what he just said. So uh, what I was just wondering is uh, this idea of, of stop movement uh, versus sustaining or start. Um, right now, so, but we, people are doing this online. So Wikipedia, I mean, I was going to give that as a counterexample, but you, you acknowledged it. Uh, it's a large movement of people, and they're trying to build something and sustain it, Linux, open source software. I wonder if we can see these digital tools be used beyond uh, that, uh, not just in protest movements, but in other movements. So right now, people can, you can use a Facebook group or a Facebook event to organize something. It's mostly kind of very limited in We lane. had a Facebook event for this. Yes, we had a Facebook yes. event for this. Um, but uh, you can imagine people coming together uh, online mm -hmm. to build a, a, a positive movement like Al Qaeda. <laughs> um, you should correct that now since there are like eight recorders taping. I'm just advising you as your audience person. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. Uh, no, but uh, you, you merely you merely came in with full voice this end. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I just think it's a it's an interesting question as to whether these tools are going to allow us to see new kinds of social movements spring up that are uh, not protest movements necessarily, but building new things movements. I would imagine so, but I don't know. I, I, I certainly hope so. I just. It, yeah, I, I'm sitting here also. I feel like we're having. In the 90s, everyone had a lot to say, more to say about this topic. And I, and I feel like um, community has been, since, you know, dawn of civilization, has been like the most attractive and most disappointing thing ever. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's always like what people aspire to. And then everyone's always let down because somebody leaves the bitches. Um, I mean, whether it's youth hostels in the 70s or now, or communes in the 60s, or like, you know, the, the utopian societies back in Aristotle's time, they've all, it's always been the great allure and the great, the great disappointment at the same time. I, the reason I think we're having trouble saying anything is I think we're finding that all the same. We're, re, we're finding that to be the same with all online communities too. Is that occasionally, and for things we reason we don't want always understand that it sometimes works so well and so amazingly and like Wikipedia comes out or suddenly a source code and it's almost like magic and then for other reasons people understand you set up some incredible community it's going to solve all the problems and you know next thing you know it just collapses or no one ever posts there and it just <laughs> turns into this disappointing and no one likes to talk about it and the organizers just kind of never talk about it again uh, you know and I, you know, and that happens that way. And sometimes a great festival was going to be the greatest. We have a great volunteer thing, and no one shows up. And sometimes you're Burning Man with forty thousand people. And I have no idea what make, what's the difference. Yeah, why does one succeed well, so much and the other one? Yeah, just and I think what Jimbo said earlier it's like, you know, sometimes it's solve. It's less the technology, but solving certain social problems and trying to figure out what it does that makes a good party and what makes a bad party. And I don't know. If maybe if people running around. No clothes on makes a good party. One of, one of the, <laughs> one, one I don't know where that came from, but anyway, I'm just trying to say one of, the, one of the possible answers yeah. is just have lots of parties. Yeah. Um, that right. that there does seem to be a physics of community, but it's like the physics of weather, not like the physics of mechanics, which is to say it's highly sensitive to initial conditions. And the more mm. specifically you want to predict it, the harder it is. It'll be colder in winter than summer, but try picking a day on which it will snow. So one of, the, one of the truths of community seems to be, if you do it a lot, some successes ramify, even if they're the minority of the, of the total effort. And, and as you say, it leaves, it leaves vast swaths of disappointment in its way. Right. And Lauren, what do you see for the art and the cultural community? I know you mentioned that Rhizome um, began out of, I guess, a message board and mailing list back in the day. But um, do you think that the community will support a future that is conducive to Art and culture online, and if so, how will they do that? Um, community was one of the hardest words I think to get my head around when I inherited Rhizome as an organization to run. I think what was um, so confusing to me is just the idea that a community was monolithic, when really what was happening at Rhizome was many different communities and many different um, individuals coming together in different ways um, around different causes. Um, and I think, but I think maybe that also has to do with Rhizome. Um, starting actually with um, a tight group of people and which has diversified. Um, 
But I do think, and this, this speaks to Clay's point, uh, or Clay's book in a way, that um, around political causes, or um, that I think things when they, <coughs> now when they happen online, can gain a kind of momentum, um, where with, without, whereas without an online community, they might not be able to. I'm thinking specifically of this um, artist, Joy Garnett, who received a cease and desist art, um, order for um, a work of art that she did that appropriated a photograph by Susan Mizellis. And she might have just been intimidated but uh, under other circumstances, but um, the, she shared it with the Rhizome community, the people on the list at the time who sort of supported her and, and backed her up and made a big deal about it so that it, was, uh, it didn't go unnoticed. Um, one of the challenges just in managing a community is trying to encourage, um, in, in terms of it like a discussion group which we have, is trying to encourage diverse participants. Um, we used to have um, a single channel list and we sort of broke it up into many different kind of discussion forums. And one of the reasons that I did that was because I felt like it was dominated by the loudest um, meanest, most often male, no offense, voices. I'm taken. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, well, how can we change that and maybe if we um, break it down into smaller groups. Um, but still, I think that that is, um, that is an issue with, you know, with the kind of community that we oversee, which is people sharing commentary, which is that not always the best kind of uh, commentary or journalism prevails, but sometimes the harshest and most sensational. So I think it's trying to um, manage those communities too. Thank you. Jonathan, would you like to have a Well, look? I feel like I, I owe a shot of optimism to <laughs> some of our depressed co panelists. I'm, depressed. I'm just talking about the, the challenges that we face. No, no, I, I credit that. But I'm going to give you a dose of optimism anyway. Please. Um, Please. 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 Well, definitely <laughs> aware of the meetup. We do. Yeah, I mean, I guess before getting too specific on a certain technology, I credit Tim's observation that you do something new that somehow magically works, and you're like, wow, that was great. Let's do it again next Friday. And then sometimes it works again, and then sometimes it doesn't. I'll bet Tim is one of those people that every time he goes to Burning Man, he's like, oh, it's all gone to hell. There's all these new people here now. <laughs> I remember when I was the only one yeah. at Burning Man. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess I think community is something you do have to continually reinvent. You've got to keep apprenticing new people into it and getting them to see there is a collective hallucination that is no less real because it's hallucinatory. I mean, that's the key. But the As can be real. I mean, I think the issue is the platform within which that can be. I completely agree, and that gets to Clay's initial conditions point. It has to be. It will become an open source platform. Which turns the question back to the technologists to say, what are the technologies that foster and facilitate no, communities? It back to the technologies. It is for us to gather together and to bridge the open source, the creative commons, and the civil society movements. I've had the privilege of being in, involved in one of those movements, not a protest movement, beginning with preparations for Rio and now preparing now for the 60th anniversary of the Human Rights Conference in Paris. This, this is happening, but what's happening is an interesting position we're in within the sort of two types of NGOs of the UN, the ECHO well, I think you should open it up. Yes, the sense is people are wanting to we, start speaking since, and they will. Actually, since only men are talking, we should open well, it up to raised hands so that we can actually. Uh, well, I'm talking a little bit. Into it. Actually, no, I have one other question that I would like to put. No, I mean from the other. <laughs> Let's, let's open it up for questions. I love how our medium is starting to resemble our dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem. The fundamental issue hasn't been gone, either here or overall economically. There is a, it's not a question of whether it's going to happen. It's a profound new Nash equilibrium that we're moving into. It will happen. The, the, the equilibrium price is basically free. The economic, the nature of the economics and the nature of our concept and ways of thinking and ways of moving and ways of being able to integrate. It, and, and it also will be massive, unprecedented freedom, but also unprecedented accountability. 
and the uh, that was an end of a sentence. I heard the end of the sentence. Thank you. That was a period. Or what we call a full stop. You know what, I actually am going to, I just have one quick question, and then I promise we'll open it up, and we have a lot of people that want to participate. But I think Jimmy brought up a great point, that um, here in the U.S. we often consider, well, everyone's online. It's just, you know, natural. And there are many other people around the world that don't have access to the Internet and that aren't yet online and that will be coming online in the next decade or so. And I think one of the related um, endeavors to this is the One Laptop per, uh, per Child project, the $100 laptop. And um, just quickly, I wanted to gauge the panel's, um, I guess, perspectives on is that the future of the internet is, I think we do have one over here, at We've least I saw. we two because I'm meshed to somebody. Aha, uh -huh. very time cool. Um, mesh ho. Yeah. So quickly, I would like to <laughs> mesh ho. Uh, engage Sorry. the panel. I'm, on, um, I'm not. I am a man. Jay, you're not helping. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll rant later. I'm going to keep quiet for a little while. <laughs> when, when will that happen? I can't do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sorry. 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 Jimmy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm. I. I am not. Uh, I'm not as excited about the one laptop per child project as most people are or appear to be. Um, I'm not convinced that it's the right technology. Uh, I've been concerned and, and about their, uh, and I think this is changing, so I, I haven't actually kept up to date, but the, the, the model of convincing some of the governments of some of the poorest places in the world to commit to one particular technology, contrary to what market forces might suggest the people themselves would want, strikes me as a uh, potentially a mistake, right? Not to say it is, but it's a warning sign when you're looking for uh, someone to try to convince a government to buy a million of something uh, that the people themselves wouldn't spend the money on themselves. I went, I toured uh, some schools in uh, Sangam Bihar, which is a, a slum, it's a squatter colony in Delhi, uh, where the kids there are going, the, the government doesn't provide any schools because the whole area is completely illegal. And the kids there are attending private schools, and the tuition range from like two and a half dollars a month to four and a half dollars a month, depending on the age of the child. Well, for a hundred dollars, you can get a lot of months of education, uh, and the parents there seem to think that's a better use of the money they're paying for it themselves. And right now, it's about one hundred eighty, not actually one hundred. Right. As well. So I'm a little skeptical. At the same time, I'm I'm very impressed with the with the the vision of the project and the. Uh, the technology, and, and I think it's great that people are pushing uh, pushing all of us to think about what happens, how, how do we get devices, whatever they might be, into people's hands that are um, generative um, and do it in a way that's affordable to more and more people. So, okay. I'll be, I, 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 I want to side with Jimbo on some of the pessimism, although there is one optimistic piece, which I think that one laptop per child is the Xerox Park of our time, which is to say the single most important failure we're ever going to see. Um, there are too many changes bundled into a single platform. They change the interface, they change the application model, they change the chip, they change the display, they change the networking model. If any one of those tanks, the whole thing goes down. Right. It's not incremental improvement over stuff we already know. It is such a bundle of changes that even if they get it 90% right, it's doomed. <laughs> but no, seriously. I mean, it's, it's the best just it's, laptop it's, in the world it's, now. Maybe the maybe the Asus Triple E is bad but, by but, ordinary standards. But Jay, but, but Jay, by your own metrics, it's selling on a push model, not a pull model. It would be like saying WAP was the best-selling well, networking well, technology in the nineties. Anybody who wants it right, at right, cost plus right, profit. Right. I'm with you 100%. But, but what what will what I think will happen is that the laptop is going to be pulled apart in the same way that what happened in Park in the in the seventies was pulled apart, and the innovations are going to go into lots of other tools. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any? Uh, well, if it, if it, can I? I'm going to ask an answer a slightly different version of the question. <laughs> Which I guess, you know, there's this interesting question when we talk about the future of the um, internet, which is the top of this panel. How much of that decided in the United States and how much is that decided um, overseas? <coughs> I think that's a, you know, the big question for here. The internet starts in the United States and is kind of embodied with American values mostly, pretty libertarian ideologies built into the, 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 the protocols. And I think the biggest, when we look back 30 years later, we'll say, well, you know, that was 
it really did have in this American cast to begin with, but it started to really change in other countries pretty quickly as they sort of took this thing and said, well, we want to make it more like Germany or more like particularly China, more like Japan, where it's mobile, more mobile, more like us. You know, this is, looks, feels too American for us, and that's okay. But I, I expect that we will, within the next 20 years, be used to the idea. This is actually a topic of the first book, which does have a name, which I wrote, which is called the, uh, what is it called? Who Controls the Internet? Um, so that you will, you will be surprised, I think we'll be surprised looking back at how different the internets are in different parts of the world when the idea of the internet was to sort of unify the world originally. That you'll look back and you'll say, well, it really did take on a sort of fundamentally different form in these different parts of the world. It looks as connected in some abstract way, but not connected uh, in deep ways. So I think that's uh, something. It's not really related to one laptop for child, but it is international. No, but yeah. that's a global vision of the internet. Yeah. And on that note, um, I'd like to open it up. I know we have a lot of hands. Um, Bill Coleman in the back. Um, so my question is immediately, gonna, it's going to be obvious that I'm talking as an anthropologist. That's what I am, and I spent um, sort of 10 years studying geeks and hackers on the internet. And one of the things that was um, interesting when I first started was that everyone, my peers made fun of me. And they made fun of me because I wasn't going to study sort of traditional real culture. And in some respects, I sort of shared that fear with them. Um, and I was just sort of happy that, you know, I wouldn't have to go to the jungle and deal with snakes. And so I went and did my field work, and instead I had to deal with things like snakes in a plane. <laughs> and so, but one of the things that I was really surprised at was that I didn't find a form of cultural anemia. Instead, I found something that was incredibly culturally deep. And I think my first comment, and this is this is going to get to the question, is that I do think that the question of community is a misguided question, but instead it's a question of culture. Um, there is an incredible amount of sort of different cultural phenomenon in the internet that change, that are um, rooted in communities that come and go. And just um, related to sort of geek culture, you have things like anonymous freakers, gamers, goons, free software hackers, um, remixers of all sorts. And I think this points to um, what Tim Wu was sort of saying, which is there's kind of a differentiation that's happening, right? And that's at the level of culture also. And the groups that I'm talking about are just sort of the American, European examples, but there's many others. So it seems to me it's not a question of um, community, but a question of culture. And so that's just a comment, and if anyone sort of had any comments about that, I'd be interested to hear. Then um, this now relates to the specific question, which is for uh, Jonathan, uh, which is the question of developers and your call for them to form a political consciousness. And actually, when you said that, I was kind of surprised because it seems to me that there is a sort of um, really strong indigenous group of people, free software hackers, who do have a very strong political consciousness. And one of the reasons why it is so strong is because it's a fusion of culture with politics. They're fighting for their productive freedom, for their cultural mores. And this is why it's a very strong form of politics. So given that I think that there is a strong form of political consciousness, um, this is not to say that you're incorrect, but what is it that you'd like to see them develop? Where would you like them to, um, to go? What um, affiliations or affinities? Because it, even if they do have a political consciousness, it's not to say that it's enough. Yeah. I guess here's my caricature of the developer, and let me say it's a caricature up front. The mileage definitely varies. But the caricature is someone who trusts his or her own hacking skills pretty much above all, maybe two or three people one click out, and their attitude towards politics is they're above all that, or maybe beneath all that, I don't know which, but they're not needing to operate on the political plane so much. To the extent they have a political identity at all, Maybe it's libertarian, but not libertarian in the sense of I need the government to come help protect my property boundaries, but I need the government to leave me alone, and I've got an electric fence and a solar panel. So, like, it's a completely self-contained ecosystem. And as we think about the community and culture question, I think you're absolutely right that there are cultural, that's why you apprentice to a community. You absorb its culture, and sometimes it's about helping when you'd rather not help. And I'm interested in having the hackers be ready to help when they're not otherwise inclined to, rather than just, you know, a lot of hackers to me act like Nelson, at least slash daughters. 
uh, Nelson from The Simpsons, that is. You know, ha ha, and like, you know, <laughs> next. <laughs> and I think they ought to get beyond that if they can. And I also think it might help to figure out what it means to have a hacker community where they wear some badges. Which is to say, Wikipedia had to involve, uh, evolve its own legislative and enforcement branches, which immediately you can complain about as, my God, these people couldn't do due process out of a paper bag, or whatever the thing would be. Or you're like, wow, how refreshing. They're actually getting it done, and their first or zeroth rule is don't let a good encyclopedia no, let me get that rule right. Don't let the rules get in the way of a good encyclopedia. That's the kind of culture I'd like to see evolve, and I think some of the tough questions really will involve people calling out other people when they think they're acting poorly. Tim, did you want to comment? I, I, I'm kind of with you. Um, <coughs> wait, maybe we've met before. I'm, I'm with you in the sense that um, every political group I've ever been involved in no matter how effective they are, always complains that, they're, that its members are not interested in politics enough. You can go to a meeting of the Federal Society, which <laughs> dominates the Supreme Court. You know, George Bush is a member of it. And they're like, we have no influence over politics. We got to. <laughs> you know, you can have go you been like, going to meetings of the Federalist Society, Tim? <laughs> um, but they do, every group, you know, you can go to Rush Limbaugh, who's like, you know, run media policy in the country, and be, he'll be like, we, you know, the right, the right has lost its influence over everything. We need to really. It, so everyone's always saying that. I think, you know, I, I agree with you. I think it's pretty strong. I mean, we're really talking here about, in some way, politics. We're talking about the future of the internet, and we're saying we need to stand up for what we believe in and do something about it. Uh, working at free, or not work at free press, but working with free press, um, I'm astonished that you can get this geeky word like net neutrality and get an angry mob together and like storm AT&T's offices or something. It's astonishing to my mind. Uh, and so, I, so I'm with you. I think it's been pretty impressive. It's still good to complain about it, or else people will say, oh, someone else is taking care of it. But I think it's in some ways kind of a, just a way of talking. Thank you. Um, questions? I agree. Thanks. Uh, that's why I both want to for comparing comments, by the way. Ah, oh, very nice. Talking about it. I'm very much Koskian. Couldn't you with ICANN be internet corporations for the same names and numbers? Instead Let's hear it for ICANN! <laughs> Our condolences. I tried. Um, you said that your book is going to be published in Russian. Are you going to be published in Russian? Yeah, yeah. The title. And uh, Jonathan talked about uh, this three-level abbreviation which has some meaning in this icon world, an internet world called the ITU, the International Telecommunications <laughs> Union. Let's hear it for the ITU. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just was wondering, have you, I mean, and I'll put, put uh, 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 I'll remi remind you of something which you guys in the US, and I'm not an American, uh, I'm from Eastern Europe, you guys here knew a lot about it. It was the Soviet Union as the empire of the EU, I think. Yeah. Uh, at the end, it turned out it wasn't what you were thinking. You were afraid that these guys are, you know, the big giant empire that will come and bomb you and send rockets, etc. But it turned out it's actually not like that. So the people today in countries which uh, some countries consider uh, not democratic or whatever, uh, they probably feel the same way we felt in Eastern Europe when you guys were thinking we are threat, we were actually watching secretly video uh, <laughs> movies which you would never watch, like with Charles Bronson or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and Chuck Norris was a national hero. Really. <laughs> so, have you thought that the control and who controls the internet will actually define what the future of the internet is? And in this respect, do you think that um, the international community either organized within certain groups like the ITU or certain intergovernmental organizations like the United Nations or the ICANN model where everybody can participate and things take place, you know, for uh, certain, in certain policies. What is the, what is the actual, uh, I mean, foreseeable future? And I know Jonathan will always give three different answers so to make sure he's on the right track. I'm amazed his head hasn't popped off yet. That's <laughs> really... Right. This is kind of a question about international relations uh, and uh, and what you know run, runs things. I think to date, over the last ten years, um, international organizations have been remarkably uninfluential in steering the future of the internet. I, I, you know, I like the UN and I like 
the ITU. I've been there. Uh, I don't. I mean, I, they, have nice, they don't have a nice building. I like them. Okay, but I like I like the idea of all these international organizations. But I think that mostly it's been driven. Mostly, uh, you know, it's been the, the future of the internet has been driven primarily by the United States, first of all, so far, uh, based on the original origins and so forth, and then by the major companies who are who are uh, in a position to decide what the infrastructure is like. And then after that, by governments, national governments, who have uh, make, made decisions about how law influences the internet. And so those are, I think, have been influential so far. I think you know, international organizations have had some very interesting meetings, but haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I just don't Your praise is fulsome, Tim. Had, had a serious effect. Um, can I, 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 well, that's it. I'll leave it there. That's my, that's my <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Questions from this side of the room? All the way in the back. Yeah, my, my question is, all this talk about freedom in the online world sort of ignores the fact that the <coughs> online world is increasingly locked down. I mean, we can't even gather in this room with a bunch of talking heads without a guy standing here talking into his sleep, right? <laughs> so the offline world being increasingly locked down what makes you think the online world isn't going to follow that pattern? Why do you think people are going to stand up and cry foul in the online world if nobody's doing it in the offline world? And if all of you people who supposedly care about freedom and privacy aren't actually doing anything, you know, you're using all of the structures that assail your own freedom and privacy on a daily basis, what makes you think anything's going to change if you guys aren't even willing to change your, your own daily practices? Like, where do you think this change is going to come from that is going to provide freedom in the future when even the people here who pretend to care about it aren't doing anything to achieve it? Yeah. I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, people like you. Um, so it's great to have heard from you before you'll be hauled away and never seen again. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and second, I think... To me, it perfectly illustrates the problem that Tim was talking about of it's all great and fun until it's not. And at some point, you actually need some form of authority. Now, in hacker communities, I think that sentence is already like, I'm dead to them. <laughs> like, how dare I say it? They built it. Yeah. Look at Debian. Look yeah. at that free software project. It is full of authority. Wikipedia, uh, yeah. Debian, they're the mm -hmm. constitutional, they spend most of their time... And I'm the saying, <laughs> well, they actually spend a lot of time coding, too, which yeah. differentiates them from some of the multi-stakeholder organizations that mm -hmm. made an appearance in the previous question. Mm -hmm. But... <laughs> I'm sure that yes. But I, can't. I think with... Biella's point is, yeah, at some point you actually sometimes have a party that isn't fun and you need to deal with it. And so... The question is when, how do you constitute that authority? How do you keep it as close to the people governed as possible and of them, right? I mean, that's the basic constitutional mm -hmm. question we've been playing around with since before Madison. Mm -hmm. And I agree, okay. it's still yeah. staring us front and center in the offline world every bit as much as the online world. Mm -hmm. It's still helpful to me to use offline analogies because the kinds of lockdown possible in the futures I'm talking about, if we transpose them into toasters and breakfasts, I still think that seems weird to people and hopefully gets them to think about how weird it is in the online world. But I agree, it's, the threat is here too. Although I, 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 want, okay, yeah. I, I want to question the, uh, the, the premise of the question, which is that people aren't in fact protesting the offline lockdown. One of the really remarkable things is that a bunch of technologies here, like flash mobs and Twitter, that have been denounced as you know, the most stupidest applications ever, right, for nothing but entertainment. Uh, flash mobs have become a tool of protest in Belarus because it's illegal to act in concert in public. Right. So in, low, in, in, in those environments, these tools have taken on a significant political ramification. Twitter has been used by pro-democracy activists in Egypt to keep track of who is and is not in police custody. Because if the police know that somebody else knows you're there, you're likely to be kept longer, but less likely to be tortured. So I think the question is really, what is going on in the United States in 2008 that makes us anomalous on that curve? Because when you look to the rest of the world, in fact, you do see a significant use of these tools to bridge the gap both for freedom online and for freedom in offline environments. We are, the, the populace of the United States seems to have been shocked into a kind of submission to the kinds of things you're talking about 
uh, in a way that I think isn't generalizable to the globe. And one of the questions might be, what can we do locally to start copying our Belarusian and Egyptian brethren, rather than assuming that, that, that this cultural moment is going to flow from us outwards. Maybe, in fact, we ought to be importing some internet culture from other places. And then moving. I think one of the things that happens in structurally when there are weeks when things are not working is people move. And they create, and the hackers and the artists create new spaces and use them. And I think that, that's what happened when I started using Wikipedia. I loved it until they started booting me up. I think the <laughs> I can't understand how that's going to happen. Yeah. You've got shells in the audience. Come on. That's too good. That was a what setup. Red Lake represents is actually entering into a reality that you define and no one else. <laughs> I still have an archive. can't find it on Wikipedia anywhere. Okay. But, but I found I moved to the archive bankless, no, no, which, which is wonderful. <laughs> but then I discovered Chili Wiki, which is a freestanding space that you can do anything and everything, and it's a free market mechanism. You can exchange and import from anywhere. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's wonderful. Okay. Um, moving away from the political commentary, thus far, the question directly towards Lauren. Um, it seems that part of the issue with the economics of internet-based art that you alluded to is that there really isn't an established discourse for these things, or rather that there are kind of two. There's more of the lower level lull speak that a lot of work um, that falls under this category responds to and incorporates, but then there's the academic level of discourse that <coughs> that Rhizome represents, and I'm wondering if part of your vision for the future of internet-based art is maybe a happy medium between those two. What was the first, what was the first, before academic, what was the first? Um, well, sort of kind of the language that exists online, I guess, that gets incorporated into these works a lot. Like memes and lolcats right. and things along I those see, lines. I, I didn't hear you. Um, I mean, I think that's already happening right now. Um, I mean, just in, in regards to the last question as well, you know, I keep on saying this, but you know, art is a space where um, people are responding to issues of privacy and freedom, and I mean, there are a lot of a, a lot of artists responding to the you know proliferation of um, private data online and what that means um, philosophically, personally, politically. And with that, I mean, artists are responding to lolcats, um, and they're responding to memes, and that's a huge thing that's, that's happening right me. now. And I think that what's secrets. interesting about it is, that, is I think that there isn't yet a critical language around those kind of artistic gestures. Um, but I think, no, I think it's there. I, I, I really do. Um, are you pulling it up? I can have, yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's two parts of it. There's the fact that um, creativity is expanded online. I mean, the notion of an artist, um, there's so many different kinds of creative gestures, so that, that role gets expanded in a way. Um, I think this is valid artistic fodder. <laughs> Um, but I think it's also the ways that artists, it's, it's interesting right now because what I see is the ways that artists are appropriating and remixing material. Um, the, the criticism is sort of embedded in their actions and I think that's valid. But um, I do think that, um, I do think that there, there needs to be more um, criticism around it and I do see that, yeah, those two things will, will bridge more. Uh, over here. Um, well, I'm more interested in the cultural and policy implications of internet governance. Um, the one thing that kind of inspired me to respond was something Clay said about the, um, the one laptop and uh, how it was kind of wrong, like it's 90%. And speaking as someone that's been using computers for quite a while, I built my own computer, my first computer at, at AIDS. I designed my own major in cybernetics in college and always been very ahead of the curve and, I, and every single one I've ever had that I've turned on, I've said, there's something wrong about this. It, it doesn't work. Like, who designed this? They didn't understand even how to engineer something. And as I got older, I realized that a lot of that was because the device was being produced under business constraints and it was produced to fulfill a business function and then it's only tangentially or secondarily gotten into education and and we can't say entertainment because we realize entertainment is a, is a business model. Mm. So when you say that, you know, he had to redesign 90% of it, you know, it took him 12, 15 years, that he even got 90% of it wrong, 
I no, no, I, I'm not saying 90% wrong. I'm saying 90% right. Okay, that's exact. That's exactly my point. So here, here's something he had, to, he had to go in and spend 12 to 15 years retooling this thing to correct the 90% that we've gotten that we got we got wrong. And and when I turned this thing on, the first time I got my hands, I'm like, this is exactly what I wanted when I was eight, even when I was 20, <laughs> even when I was 30. And and that's really interesting too, because all of a sudden he's created something that speaks to both the eight-year-old and even the 30 or 40-year-old. They both can use as a tool, kind of subversively undercutting this this dichotomy with this tension. We've Have you tried the keyboard? He subversively undercut the tension we have between youth culture and adult culture and how they, they fight each other. So, so. But the, re the real question that I kind of want to lead to with that, and I just, want, I just wanted to respond to that because I was like, this is, this is really an amazing device, is, um, is the fact that, I mean, the word that I don't think anyone's even, even used that. <coughs> Is, is capital, and, and these machines represent the, the embodiment of capital. And we talk about, we, we seem to be already have brought into this concept of content and images and these cool things we create, but what is the, can anybody gonna make one of these in their, back, in their backyard? I mean, it's really, really tough. And there is a, there is an element of capital that's there. What is, what is the, so the question is, what is the, what's the countervailing force there that, let me, bring, let, me, let me bring in the question of social capital, because that's really where I think the OLPC question comes, right? I, I do think that they've gotten the technology 90% right. right? I, I am not saying 90% wrong. The, the problem is that it is so bundled and so novel, right? When personal computers spread, they spread downhill, and everyone had their own system administrator, which was the person they knew who knew a little bit more than they did, right? And I'm the sysadmin now for three families, my own, my parents, and my sisters, right? Um, if my if my father-in-law could turn his machine on long enough to stay on a phone call, I'd be the sysadmin for four families, right? I, that function is missing, right? The OLPC is rolling out so flat that the social capital, the, the downhill socialization, every object is surrounded by an, every co complicated object is surrounded by an ocean of practice. And that currently does not exist around OLPC. If there was a way to make a reach back function for geeks from places where the OLPC is rolling out back to places where there are people like you who can take the thing apart and explain it, that might substitute for some of that social capital, but I don't see that model now, and that seems to me to be the, the very novelty of the machine that you're talking about in terms of technical excellence drains the social capital from the environment in which OLPC is launched. Why didn't the question to the, the internet itself? I mean, if the internet is, is driven by, by capital, and there, is, and there tends to be this resistance to, to the business logic that's driving it and where it's going, that at the same time is co-opted by the beautiful images and the porn sites and all the, the, the entertainment stuff, then, then what, 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 is the real, what is the real tension in the future of the internet? What is the, what is the counterpoint to that that's going to... Uh, Lynn, did you want to I think that's a really, I think that's a really big question. Uh, please let, wrong let, let our panelists say that. Let Tim talk, please. Laptops are basic <laughs> of and more people connect to the internet or the cell phone. Social norm. Thank you. Uh, um, I think you. I think you've touched on a really crucial question here. From studying media history, and this is going to be under the heading "What New Media Can Learn from Old Media." Um, I've found the most important thing. Nice in determining whether media turn sour or, or go in directions we don't like is the underlying ethics of the people running it. More than the law, more than the technology, more than anything else, just their ethics of what they think this is for and what they think they need to do with this. And that is a discussion we absolutely have and we are having here with, the in, with our internet. Um, you know, many people look at old media and look at like New York Times and say, well, you know, old media and they get crusty and <laughs> boring, whatever. Um, <laughs> Nate, right, right, love you all. But you know, you gotta give one thing with the New York Times, it does not operate on a poor profit basis. <laughs> there are, no, I'm not kidding, right. there are so That's many right. things that they could Two do. Two classes of stock? What? Yeah. There are so many things that they could 
do, and uh, so many other forms of media could do that would be more pro It doesn't make any sense to have 60 reporters in Baghdad, which is what they had, which is what they have right now. They have a staff of 60 in Baghdad. If you were smart, you'd have one guy in Baghdad, or nobody in Baghdad, rely on blogs or something like that. But they think you know, it's important to find out what's really going out here. There is a lot of ways in which the New York Times is, is absolutely idiotic as a business. And I wonder, and I fear that we don't, that internet companies don't always have that same ideology. They have this, you know, they forget that they're media companies. Yahoo walked into China like it was walking into, you know, mm -hmm. the local butcher store. <laughs> I don't know what that means. But. <laughs> and yet, it's a perfect quote. It is. Yeah. <laughs> they walked into there with no sense of responsibility, no sense they're a media company, with the only idea in their head is how can we get our stock up another 10 points. Right? The internet has the luckiness of being based on a, a sort of cloud of, of, of uh, government and, and, and good thoughts and, and you know, hippieism. But it is essential that people dis, dis have, begin to have a conscience and begin to have an ethics of making this into a, a, a proper and something that serves something other than profit and something that is devoted to a better society and better humanism. All right. Thank you. Okay, our last yeah. question. Um. Right. How do I? I'll skip the soliloquy so I can ask two questions. Uh, 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 nice, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else that wants to contribute? Uh, one, what, what is your idea of where the start energy should go instead of stop energy? Like, instead of stop energy. Where should that be focused and maybe use improv anywhere as a starting point to talk about? They get together in random situations, like they just freeze in Grand Central Station for five minutes. It's start energy, but it's not exactly focused. And the second question is, uh, what is Stephen Colbert like in person? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's, he's great in person. He comes backstage and says, I'm going to be a jerk out there. And then uh, you go out there, and then he's a jerk, and it's still surprising. Uh, to, the, to, the, to, to the first question, um, one of the amazing things about the internet has been it has been an absolutely guru-less revolution. Right? People like us spend a lot of time looking at it. We spend a lot of time talking about it, writing about it. And, and at the end of the day, nobody needs us. Right, if we went away, I mean, alas, for us, in a way, but I mean, we, you know, we try to do some good. I don't want to, I don't want to underplay that. But if, 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 right, if everybody who writes about this were to go away tomorrow, somebody who got their hands on the no, first computer, their first computer, and plugged it into the plug that cable in the back or opened it up to a Wi-Fi network, would still be astonished and inspired. Uh, and a number of people actually got quite bitter in the 90s, calling this revolution early, and then thinking they were leading the parade. Right? <laughs> Parades have a route. This thing is just, it's going everywhere. So I, I would never say where I think the start energy should go. I think it should go where the people in the group think it should go. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful for a flowering of interesting and political and cultural movements, and I'm basically confident that if we give people the freedom, they'll, that will come too. Right? But we're also going to get lots of lolcats and whatever else, and things that seem like distractions or uninteresting to one group but interesting to the other group. But, but I think the really important thing is maximize, maximize the freedom of people when they get their hands on this stuff to do what they want. Scott Bradner, the guy, the guy with the best, uh, the best email address in, in all of history, <laughs> sob at harvard.edu, uh, as trustee of the Internet Society, said, the Internet means that you don't have to convince anybody else that something is a good idea before trying it. And that capability has been remanded to the individual for years. It is coming increasingly to groups. And that seems to be a much more worthwhile goal than figuring out what the start energy then, then starts to create. Uh, Jimmy, would you like to have the last word on that? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, he's exactly right about Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've heard that, too. I've heard that. Yeah, no, others. actually, a really nice guy who apparently likes Wikipedia, contrary to all impressions. But um, no, I, I think that that's African right. Events. I mean, for me, the, the kind of thing I'm interested in uh, is if we can generate good uh, social spaces online uh, so people can do uh, engage in healthy conversations, which is a, it's about a balance between um, 
you don't want to you don't want to have a police state where people aren't allowed to dissent, but you also don't want to let the conversation be dominated by trolls. If you can navigate that that middle ground, then you'll get all kinds of different um, reasonably positive social movements out of it, and they won't all agree with each other. Uh, of course, right? Uh, there's no one simple correct uh, thing that's going to come out of that, but I think we're all benefited to the extent that we have uh, divergent groups of people working together, but hopefully in healthy spaces. So for me, that's really important. I would Great. follow up. Oh. Yeah. I just want to say um, to their points that, yeah, I think that if there's one thing that I see in the future, it's um, coordination and hybridity. I think that something that I see a lot of in culture is people thinking maybe in, in black and white terms or, you know, is print you know, is the, is the internet putting print out of business and these kind of questions. And I think that it, it really is an issue of looking at um, best practices across these, um, across these different models and, and coordinating them. And that's hopefully what, um, what we'll see more of. Great. Well, please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. Nicole Arts in particular, Free Culture at NYU. Unfortunately, Fred Benenson isn't here, and the Internet Society of New York. So please, let's thank them as well. And um, we will now have a wine and cheese reception. Hopefully, we can all fit um, downstairs on the first floor in the Greenberg Lounge. So please join us. Come downstairs, head out of the room, and um, have some wine and cheese. So thanks again for coming.